LAist Studios. Hi, everyone. This is Retake. I'm your host, John Horn. On this week's episode, what the Walt Disney Company's latest earnings report tells us about how the entertainment industry is trying to reinvent itself and how it's going so far. Plus, I'll talk with the director and co-writer of the first ever German film adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front. You can tell a hero's journey in an American movie. There is a sense of honor about what happened. And in Germany, you can't feel anything but guilt, shame, horror. But first, here's my retake for this week. Some movies are instantly disposable. John Travolta's Battlefield Earth comes to mind. If the worker revolt takes place, my informants tell me that the first order of business is to separate you from your head. But tossing out a documentary film distributor's entire business? That seems inexplicable. Yet that's exactly what David Zaslav did as the head of the newly formed Warner Brothers Discovery. A few weeks back, Zaslav announced that he was gutting CNN Films, one of the biggest distributors of documentary movies and series. Going forward, CNN will no longer acquire independently produced nonfiction work, meaning documentary filmmakers will have one fewer outlet for distribution. The corporate visionless of, you know, like losing such a jewel, you know, it's just it's devastating. That's Laura Poitras. She's an Oscar-winning documentarian. Her films include the Edward Snowden documentary Citizen Four and the upcoming All the Beauty and the Bloodshed about the Sackler family and OxyContin. It's scary. I'm not going to I'm not going to argue. It's a scary time. It's pretty easy to associate CNN with Anderson Cooper, John King's election night maps, and, well, not much else. But the cable channel's documentary unit has been involved in some of the most important journalistic work of the past two decades. Its movie releases include RBG. I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Blackfish. They're an animal that possesses great spiritual power not to be meddled with. And Navalny. Alexei Navalny has taken on the most dangerous job in the world, challenging the leader of the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin. CNN Films' new focus will be to spend less money and make everything in-house rather than buy movies like all of the features I just mentioned. It's all part of the massive $3.5 billion in cuts implemented by Zaslav, who, I should note, took home $247 million in pay last year as the company digs out from more than $50 billion in crippling debt. Zaslav previously closed the streaming news site CNN Plus just as it was launching, writing off $300 million. His team decided not to release in theaters or on any streaming platform the completed Warner Brothers film Batgirl, and Warner Brothers Discovery just canceled the expensive and increasingly less popular HBO series Westworld. Let me be clear, Zaslav told Wall Street analysts last week, we did not get rid of any show that was helping us. That's helping defined as good for the bottom line, not good for the culture and society. Documentaries might not offer a huge return on investment, but we'll all be poorer after we lose one of its most important distributors. Coming up, a film adaptation of the World War I novel All Quiet on the Western Front that feels very relevant to the state of the world today. All Quiet on the Western Front is a 1928 anti-war novel written by a German veteran of World War I. It's also a film adapted for the screen for the first time in 1930. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture and the Oscar for Best Director for Lewis Milestone. But in Germany, the movie was banned and the book it was based on burned. Now it's been adapted by a German filmmaker for the first time, and it's Germany's submission this year for the Academy Award for Best International Feature. I spoke with Edward Berger, the director and co-writer of the film, at the Middleburg Film Festival. When you first became involved in this project, I believe there was a screenplay, and it was in English, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so 
and probably by American screenwriters. A British. British, okay, mm-hmm. but there is a non-German perspective mm-hmm. on this film. What is the radical difference in the point of view that any German filmmaker, obviously you're a German filmmaker, would have on this story? Well, obviously, you know, England and America has a very different history to Germany. Lucky you. Uh, but uh, no, um, Germany, you know, is, is in a singular situation that in the last century it succumbed twice to its destructive impulses and brought horror and war to the world. And that, you know, you inherit some of that. You know, it's in my DNA what happened. I sort of carry that around. And in America, uh, you know, you, for example, your country was roped into the war against their will. They liberated Europe from fascism in the Second World War. Our movie takes place in the first one. But both times, they didn't really want to get into this war in Europe, in a continent that's far away. Uh, Same with England. England was attacked. They didn't ask for this war, so they defended themselves. And that leaves a very different legacy with the people that come afterwards, with the country. You inherit something else. And with the filmmakers that come afterwards. And as a filmmaker... Your DNA, your history, your psyche, your sensibilities informs every creative decision. And I thought, if we make this movie, again, filming this book, this German book, then we must, you know, we automatically have to bring, and we will bring, because we're German filmmakers, we'll bring a very specific German perspective to the story, which is hopefully and automatically, because of our upbringing, very different to the American perspective. Because... uh, you know, your ancestors, you, you know, there's something, you know, there's something to be proud of. There's, they're a hero, you know, in a way that you can tell a hero's journey in an American movie. Uh, there is a sense of honor about what happened. And in Germany, you can't feel anything but guilt, shame, horror, you know, and a sense of weight and responsibility about the war. And that ideally flows into the movie in the end. And And when I read the script... I did, you know, there were great qualities in the script and I really, uh, obviously I I engaged with it, so I liked it. But I did feel that I wanted to add more of that German perspective and more from the book into the movie. I would say, speaking broadly, because certainly there are distinctions and people who don't feel this way, but Germany, generally as a country, has acknowledged its history and confronted it and admitted to its sins. I've been to a lot of the museums in Berlin that address the Holocaust and the war. And yes, there are people who are going to disagree about how much of Germany's or any country's history you want to acknowledge and admit. But Germany seems to have done a better job than some neighboring countries, Poland, for example, and certainly has addressed Nazism much better than I think our country has has addressed slavery. As it stands today, there are more statues to Confederate generals in the United States today still than there are of abolitionists, which seems strange, but it's true. But do you feel you're, you are part of, a, part of a nation that recognizes there is a responsibility to confront history in any way possible, including storytelling through film? Well, I think there's no escape. There's no way around it. You know, I, I have it in my, in my bones. I feel it every day. I feel that weight. I feel that responsibility. And I feel that shame, and uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put that shame into a film uh, if I make one on the topic. And um, I think that's very kind that you acknowledge that in Germany it's been uh, sort of we're dealing with it with the past. But there's also no way around it. In my view, there's been no such sin committed in recent history. The weight of it, the size of it, the sheer horror, the terror of it. The, it's unimaginable. So in order to somehow get through that and continue, what can you do besides try to um, redeem yourself or atone or do good or try to bring people together afterwards? Um, that's the only, only possibility to... In a way, that's also for our characters in the movie. They go through the same thing. They try to sort of heal and, and survive. I think it's fair to say there are a lot of modern themes that are in both the film and the novel. When you are reading the book and adapting it, how obvious is it that what was written about a century ago is as relevant today as it was when the novel was written? Well, unfortunately, war seems always to be relevant. We had one 10 years ago. We're going to have one in 10 years. 
and we unfortunately have one right now, which we couldn't know two and a half years ago. But what made us make the film is not only a sense of, okay, we can bring our perspective and what our DNA, what we inherited into this film, but also a, an observation in politics where I felt a clear shift to the right and towards nationalism and an un unhealthy sense of patriotism, I felt. You know, you have Hungary, uh, a right-wing, far right-wing government, neo-fascist governments in other European countries elected. You had America, a, a, a far shift to the right. In England, there was Brexit. So suddenly, populists started questioning institutions that brought us peace for 70 years in Europe, a continent ravaged by wars, by many wars. And I just felt like you also felt that aggressive atmosphere that you that aggressive semantics that you saw on television, on the news, uh, propagated by these populist parties battling each other, you noticed it in the tube as well. People start talking like that as well. Suddenly there's a, more, a bigger sense of aggression, uh, more fear, more uh, fear of the foreign. And that just felt like it reminded me of a time a hundred years ago where it must have been fairly similar. So it just felt relevant to, to start that film back then. Right. You're talking about people like Viktor Orban yeah. in Hungary or Marine Le Pen, uh, who is not in power, but certainly represents an extreme nationalist, populist, anti-immigrant faction. In this story, because it's told from a German filmmaker with German actors, I think it's fair to say there are no heroes in this story, Daniel Rule's character is trying to end the war, so he's trying to do something heroic, but he's certainly on the wrong side of history. But your lead character, Paul, he's not heroic because he is killing people, I mean, but he is killing people on behalf of something he doesn't understand. So how do you try to create a character that might be sympathetic even if he's not heroic? Well, um, in the end, he's just a kid. He's a 17-year-old or 18-year-old kid who was roped into a war, who was manipulated by populists again, by demagogues. Uh, and I think we empathize with someone, no matter what country he's from, who is an innocent young boy who then gets suddenly realizes that all the values, everything he's learned, just dies in the mud and all, his soul dies in the mud, and he needs to have it die, otherwise he'd, it'd break his heart. You know, it's sort of a wall that... That's what the story is about. You, you come from a... For me, the essence of the book is your wide-eyed young man th thinking, God, the world is, is ours, you know, that we, anything is possible, and you have all these opportunities, and you end up being a soulless, dead, killing machine who doesn't have a purpose in life, you know? And that journey, I think, is heartbreaking to anyone who watches it, no matter what country, country you're from. And I would say not, um, it's not that much different what goes on today, you know, in other countries, in other continents, uh, where, you know, young soldiers don't really know what they're doing. You know, they're told something else and they actually end up in a war that is unjustified. I, I can think of one right now. Yeah. That would be Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Absolutely. where Vladimir Putin is sending a lot of young soldiers and people who are, never should be on a battlefield, who are old or infirm with antiquated weapons. I was going to ask you about the novel itself, when it was published, because I think it's fair to say it was not popular in Germany, mm. especially with Hitler's rise to power. What happened to the book and the original movie, was shot in 1930, is that right, Lewis Millstone's film? Did, was it ever exhibited in, in Germany? What happened to it? I think the film was released in 1930 in Germany. And uh, at the premiere, I think on the second, the second day after the premiere, the second screening, SA, Nazi troops, with Goebbels uh, running to their help, infiltrated a, a showing and uh, let white mice into the audience, you know, just to clear the of, theater. To clear the theater. And this would be Joseph Goebbels, the jo propaganda minister. Exactly. The and so they disturbed this showing, they interrupted it, and afterwards they, they demanded that the film would be banned. And it was banned for a while until it was censored. It was reshown then a year or two later, censored with cut scenes. But when the Nazis came another year or two later, it was forbidden. And the book, of course, was burned. And Remark left with many of his other fellow writers, and he actually came to live in America 
in Los Angeles. He married Paulette Goddard, who, who used to be married to Charlie Chaplin. What in your mind was your cinematic idea to make sure that the audience was, to say it kind of, kind of glibly, was on the battlefield? What were the cinematic ideas that you had to make sure that we were, as much as we could be, part of the story? I think with every department that worked on the film, the directive, our idea was, uh, let's put the audience in, in Paul Bäumer's shoes, the main character's shoes. Um, let's have them feel what he feels. And that, let's start with the camera. Camera is sort of the simplest. The camera was always the guiding. The North Star for the camera was to understand what was in Paul's stomach and then place the camera accordingly. If it was rage, if it was fear, you know, whatever that emotion was, that sort of determines where the camera goes. You know, does it go on top of him? Does it go behind him? Does it go really wide and he gets lost in the melee? But the other element, what we try to get across, and it might sound like a contradiction almost, but the book, what it succeeds in doing really well, it's like a reporter. It doesn't emotionalize, really. It doesn't, it's a bit distant. It just des describes and lets you draw your own conclusion. It lets you, you know, be emotional or harrowed or whatever you want to feel. And I try to do, or we all try to do, a little bit the same. And while really getting Paul's POV and putting us into his shoes, also staying slightly back, even if it's just a camera just five inches further away, to give it a feeling of we're observing and we're not over-sentimentalizing, we're not over-emotionalizing. We want to let you be drawn in by yourself and, and do your own conclusions. And that was what we followed. It was good to see you. And congratulations, too, uh, for Germany selecting this film as its submission for next year's Academy Awards. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's wonderful, of course. It's, it's you know, a testament. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Edward Berger, the director and co-writer of All Quiet on the Western Front. The film is in select theaters and available on Netflix now. And finally, here's my weekly entertainment news chat with KPCC Morning Edition host, Suzanne Watley. We don't usually chat about Wall Street earning reports, but the Walt Disney Company announced its latest quarterly results earlier this week, and it looks like there's some news there. Just a bit, and I would say not what you would call good news. And I think the Disney results paint a really good picture of how Hollywood is laboring to reinvent itself, abandoning traditional businesses in favor of streaming. So Disney's core movie business used to be in movie theaters, not anymore. It's Disney Plus and Hulu and ESPN Plus. But making that switch which is really hard to do, not only because of the expense, but also because of the competition. In Disney's case, Netflix had a big head start, and there are other streaming companies like Apple and Amazon that don't really need streaming to make a profit because they have other businesses that do really well. Disney has theme parks, merchandise, TV production, broadcast, and cable networks, but Disney has put most of its eggs in the streaming basket and says that that's the company's future. So how is Disney doing? Uh, you know the expression, sometimes you have to spend money to make money. Disney has the first part down. They are spending money. They are not making money. Uh, Disney said earlier this week that it added a better than expected 12 million streaming accounts in the last quarter. But those gains came at an enormous cost. Disney lost nearly $1.5 billion on streaming in the last three months. Oh my. And if you look at the past year, its streaming losses are around $4 billion. And since it launched Disney Plus three years ago, its streaming losses are $8 billion. Disney CEO Bob Chapek said he believes streaming can be profitable in just two years. And if you believe that, I have some Florida swampland uh, <laughs> I'd like to sell you because the only way to get there is a combination of these three things. Sign up millions more subscribers, raise monthly subscription fees, and lower marketing technology and programming costs. Wall Street doesn't really think that's possible, and Disney's stock plummeted after the earnings came out. 
So what does this say about streaming more broadly? Well, first, it's really expensive to create, market, and program a streaming service, and the competition is insane. We heard a lot about inflation in the United States around the election, but we're doing better than Europe, uh, where inflation is worse. So if your paycheck isn't going as far as it used to, you're probably not going to be that quick to resubscribe to all of your streaming or entertainment subscriptions. Disney has said it's going to realign its monthly subscription fees. What what do you think realign means to most people? Raise it. That would be correct. <laughs> the price of a monthly subscription for the current ad-free version of Disney Plus on December 8th, mark your calendars, will go up from $11, will go up from $8 to $11, and if you think US inflation is high, that raise is about 4 times higher than the rate of inflation right now, or a 38% in, increase. And, you know, if if they can raise the prices and deliver content that people want to see, they'll succeed. But to go from a $4 billion loss in the last year to profitability seems mathematically really, really difficult. And it doesn't seem to incentivize new subscribers when you're presenting um, a higher subscription fee. Yes. And, you know, listen, Disney, the Wakanda Forever is opening this weekend. That movie is going to be huge at, at the multiplex and will be probably big once it gets to Disney+. Plus. But Disney+, Plus has taken so many movies from theaters and putting on the streaming platform that I think people, you know, know what they're going to get. And there's no real big hit that's going to come that's going to make them change their thinking. It's very much still a hit-driven business. I mean, Netflix is doing really well because of this Dahmer miniseries. So if they have hit shows, maybe they can make it. But again, other other streaming platforms have hit shows as well, and they may not be raising their prices quite as aggressively as Disney just did. All right. Um, KPCC's arts and entertainment reporter, John Horn. Thank you so much, John. My pleasure, as always, Suzanne. Thanks for listening to Retake. We'll see you again next week. I'm John Horn. Retake is produced and engineered by Michael Cosentino and Monica Bushman. The editor is Suzanne Levy. And a special thanks to the entire KPCC LAS newsroom. Have you ever read a book that completely changed your perspective on life? Me too. I'm Tracy Thomas, book lover and host of the Stacks podcast, and we're changing up the book club game with a new literary live event series that will make you want to put down your phone and pick up a book. Join me November 16th at the Crawford Family Forum in Pasadena with my guest, Sam Sanders, host of the Intuit podcast and author Danielle Smith, whose new book is Shine Bright. Get your tickets now at las.com slash events.